Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studio, it's time for the GNFCC 400 Insider. Connect, build, and grow with the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the November Wellstar Chamber Luncheon Series event. I'm Alan A. Jarvis Smith and Howard. It's my pleasure to serve as your board chairman for this year. Thank you for Zooming in today. And since this pandemic started 249 days ago, I think your CEO, Callie, can confirm for me and her closing remarks, we might be on chamber Zoom call number 151 right now. So before we get started with today's program, I want to recognize and thank our luncheon series naming sponsor by calling on Lindsay Petrini, Chief Operating Officer of Wellstore North Fulton Hospital. Lindsay is also the Chamber's incoming board chairman for 2021. Lindsay? Hi, Alan. Thank you. Um, Wellstar continues to sponsor this luncheon, and we are just so proud to be a part of it and um, this Chamber of Commerce. And so today, I'd really like to take the opportunity to talk to you um, about the hospital's new stroke capabilities. Um, recently, North Fulton became um, one of four hospitals within the state of Georgia to be able to provide comprehensive stroke services. When it, when it comes to stroke, stroke is really one of those particular incidents where time and hospital capability really matters. And so I would say from a standpoint of what we're able to provide now at North Fulton with our uh, thrombectomy capabilities, we are, we are literally able to um, take individuals with stroke who've suffered from strokes that may have had significant rehab over um, the course of, of that stroke, now they're able to walk out in some cases the next day. And so I just want to reiterate the importance of understanding that North Fulton now has that comprehensive stroke capability and to remind you um, that if you or if someone you know is suffering from a stroke, um, time is brain and it is extremely important to get them to a hospital. Uh, but here in North Fulton, um, it's important to know that those services are at Wellstar North Fulton and that we can provide that particular um, type of service if needed. For those of you that don't know the symptoms of a stroke, and I think that's really important to make you aware, the symptoms of a stroke can be sudden dizziness or loss of balance, um, sudden trouble seeing out of one or both eyes, um, numbness in an arm, uh, facial weakness, or an impairment of speech. If you see that in a loved one that seems unusual, get them to a hospital extremely fast. So again, it is uh, our pleasure to be a part of this luncheon and a pleasure to be a part of the chamber in here today. Thank you, Alan. Thank you again, Lindsay. We very much appreciate Wellstar's continued support for our chamber and with your sponsorship of the 2020 Chamber Luncheon Series. Next, let's have a few remarks from today's presenting sponsor, the North Fulton CID, and I'd like to ask their CEO, and my friend, Senator Brandon Beach, to say a few words. Brandon? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all your hard work uh, during this pandemic uh, as chairing the chamber. Uh, listen, it's a pleasure to sponsor the, this event with the chamber. You know, the chamber is one of the entities, or is the entity in North Fulton, that advocates for pro-business policies, and we are glad to uh, be joined at the hip with Callie and her organization. I want to thank you both of y'all for being at our ribbon cutting this morning of the new triple F lanes on Windward Parkway. Uh, that was a project that we all worked on together and it was great to see uh, everybody there to cut the ribbon and see the new lanes and the new turn lanes there. Uh, as I said in my presentation this morning, I say every time I can, there's a direct correlation between infrastructure investment and job creation and economic development. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists today because I think now there's even a more direct correlation between infrastructure investment of what I call 21st century infrastructure. That's connected vehicles, small cells, and, and the right uh, cell towers and everything that we need in place as we move into helping uh, alleviate uh, congestion and increasing mobility through technology. So I'm really looking forward to hearing our guests today. And it was a, just a great pleasure to, uh, to sponsor this and we'll continue to be a sponsor with Callie and her organization. And thank you all for everything you do. And uh, everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. We appreciate the North Fulton CID's tremendous investment in this community our chamber and your continued support of chamber events and activities. Secretary of State 
excuse me, Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chow, told the D.C. flight attendees last month, that's when D.C. flew to Atlanta instead of us flying to D.C., that our voice really does matter, especially when it comes to federal funds for transportation infrastructure. She had some very nice comments about you in particular, Brandon, and the North Fulton CID and the work that it does. Um, I personally appreciate your bold, bold vision over the past years, looking into the future as you did this morning for projects to accommodate the growth in our area, which was certainly evident by the ribbon cutting this morning, which I'll let you and Chairman Armstrong address, but that ribbon cutting today started many, many years ago. So thank you for your vision as we go forward. I also want to thank our media sponsor today, John Ray with the North Fulton Business Radio X. John might still be taping another show. So John, if you're on, uh, you have the microphone. If not, we'll continue on with the program. All right, on with the program. It's my pleasure today to introduce my friend and your moderator, Kerry Armstrong. Kerry is a managing director and partner with Pope and Land Real Estate, a commercial real estate investment and development firm specializing in office and mixed use projects, primarily in the southeastern U.S. He joined Pope and Land in July of 2012 as an and is involved in the development, marketing, leasing, and management of its projects, along with identifying and securing future investment opportunities. Gary is actively involved in numerous professional, civic, educational, and charitable organizations, and currently is in his fourth term as chairman of the Atlanta Regional Commission. As you know, the ARC is the official planning agency for the 10 County metro area. Kerry also serves as chairman of the North Fulton CID and is a member of the state public private partnership guidelines committee. Kerry, thank you so much for serving as a moderator today. We learn as we learn more about the latest technology for connecting vehicles, school safety applications, and other exciting projects. Kerry, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. This is an exciting uh, chance to hear from some very smart people uh, and to be a part and among uh, people that I think the world of. Among those people is the mayor of Alpharetta, Mayor Jim Gilvin, who is on the line. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would you like to add a few mark remarks? Kerry, I just want to thank you for, one, calling me among the smart people on this call. <laughs> I'm not sure I deserve that kind of uh, compliment based on the crowd that we have today. But I, I want to thank you particularly because, uh, as Mr. Najjar noted, you are active in a lot of organizations, and that's an understatement. Your role in helping Alpharetta become the city it is in both your service through the Atlanta Regional Commission and through your investments in Pope and Land and things have, have made a tremendous difference. So we're very grateful for that. And we're grateful for your um, ability to help attract technology companies like a IATL and, and a lot of the things that will be discussed today. We're very fortunate to have you in our community as partnership and especially as leader of the CID, who has been a tremendous partner, along with Senator Beach's leadership in the investments that have helped us become the city we are. So thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad I called on you to speak. <laughs> <laughs> this is an exciting uh, program for me because this is where a lot of my hats come together. Uh, I get to wear all of them at the same time. Of course, Pope and Land uh, tries to invest and develop in communities that are headed in the right direction. They're strong, viable communities. They've got great future uh, futures ahead of them. Uh, they have uh, a business-friendly environment and a a place where we can be confident that our investments are going to grow and thrive. Uh, at the same time, through my involvement in the Atlanta Regional Commission and uh, particularly with the North Fulton CID, uh, the issue of traffic, traffic safety, mobility, all of those things are, are front of mind topics uh, in any of those enterprises. And uh, so the opportunity to make the world we uh, live in and invest in and raise our families better uh, makes it particularly uh, exciting. And uh, our topic today is one example of how that is happening with the help of some really talented, forward-thinking people. 
Uh, the topic uh, really is something that's near and dear to our hearts. The North Fulton CID and the city of Alpharetta have invested in transportation technology uh, that helps with mobility. It helps with public safety in dramatic ways. And uh, our panelists are going to talk about that and also some exciting things uh, coming up in the future. So I want to introduce our panelists. Our first is Brad Sturtz. Uh, Brad is Director of Government Affairs for Audi of America. He is co-chair of Partners for Automated Vehicle Education, or PAVE, a coalition of diverse innovators and mobility stakeholders uniting to better equip the public and policymakers about the transportation revolution. He's also director of Audi Government Affairs in the Washington, D.C. office, where he works on a range of rapidly evolving topics, as you can imagine, including automated vehicle testing and deployment, electric vehicles, charging infrastructure, connected vehicle technologies, safety, cybersecurity, emissions regulations, and trade. Also with me is my dear friend, Brian Mulligan. Uh, welcome, Brian. Brian Thanks, is man. president of Applied Information, Inc. Applied Information was established in 2011 to meet the need for a technology company that could apply the new wireless Internet of Things, cloud computing, and connected vehicle technologies. Uh, into modern solutions for the transportation sector. Applied information has established technologies in multiple sectors in transportation, including intersection management, connected vehicle, uh, and priority exemption, pre uh, priority preemption systems, pedestrian safety, mobile data acquisition, parking, and ITS management. More recently, Brian has led the way in successful smart city and connected vehicle deployments. So, gentlemen, let's get started. Uh, Brian, if you'll start us off, can you give us a brief introduction to the IATL, where we are seated? Uh, what goes on here in, in terms of connected vehicles? Oh, th thanks, Kerry, for the, for the introduction. Um, we, we're at the IATL. It's the Infrastructure Automotive Technology Laboratory. And, you know, it's also a bit of a pun on the ATL, ATL being the Atlanta region. Uh, but, but really, this is a culmination of uh, a vision that we uh, sort of stumbled across, interestingly enough, as we joined an organization with the auto manufacturers and the technology companies like Audi and Polcom and, and various other uh, mobile network operators like AT&T and Verizon and so forth. We realized that um, there, was a very, there was very little understanding about the other stakeholders in transportation about uh, how the infrastructure actually works. And so that led me um, to realize that the only way we're going to uh, get all these private sector players to collaborate is by standing up a facility where everybody can see this working in practice. And so uh, you've got to stand it up somewhere and with the help of Kerry and the, uh, and, and the relationship that we had, we stuck a pin right in the middle of Alpharetta and, say, and declared Alpharetta to be the world's center of connected vehicle technologies. And at the same time, we were working with the city of, of Alpharetta on a connected vehicle technology to uh, get the paramedics to citizens in need more quickly. It's called traffic preemption, where all the Alpharetta fire trucks are equipped with connected vehicle technology that turns the lights green for the fire trucks and brings everybody else safely to a halt. And so really, and then we stood up uh, the IATL at the beginning of this year, and as everybody knows, COVID struck and uh, changed everybody's world. So we now got a broadcast studio here where we broadcasting this message out of the IATL and all this equipment that you see behind me here. Um, and we'll touch on some of it a bit more later, but this is all the technology that's used in the United States. So that means uh, somebody like Audi can come to the IATL and see all the infrastructure that's in the United States without having to cover around the United States. They can see it all here and then learn how to interact with school beacons and intersections and so forth uh, practically. So that's what the ITL uh, vision is all about. Great. Brad, can you tell us about Audi's Connected Vehicles Program and the special vehicle being used for this? Sure. So uh, I'll start with a little history lesson, um, not too long. But in 1999, it's been that long since the Federal Communications Commission dedicated the 5.9 spectrum for vehicle uh, to everything communications as a safety uh, component in the vehicles that are going to be coming in the future. 
it's taken quite a while to get there, but I think pretty confidently we're right on the edge of being able to launch this. And that's what we're, we wanted to uh, begin to roll out in Alpharetta with the project that we're going to be talking about here and with uh, ITA, IATL and Brian Steen. Um, so what this is, is a, we, we favor a technology called cellular vehicle to everything. And uh, Audi has been a global leader for this um, particular ver version of uh, V2X technology, uh, largely because it, it really dovetails well with the widespread use of cellular uh, around the world. And it provides a really good pathway to go from uh, 4G LTE type technologies that we have today into uh, the 5G world that we're all anticipating. And so, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's been, you know, imaginations over the years about vehicles being able to talk to each other. And uh, one of the things we wanted to show in Alpharetta is it's not just cars being talking, being able to talk to other cars. It's the ability of, of uh, special safety circumstances to be recognized by our cars. So we've are, we're equipping some Audi e-tron uh, electric vehicles with the unique radios that will be able to communicate with the uh, school zone beacons that Brian mentioned in, in and around Alpharetta and also in school buses. We want to we be able to show that this technology will be able to alert our cars and our drivers to uh, the existence of a stop school bus if it's kind of around the corner or the driver may not be paying as much attention as they need to. And then, you know, we have a, we see a ton of opportunity as well to send those alerts to the driver in the cars when they're approaching a school zone, particularly in, in cases where school might be letting out early and the, the school zone hours vary at times. And that's where we really want to integrate with the, the systems that Brian has, uh, is developing and bringing to the market to be able to have the school zone signs communicate with the cars and tell the driver to slow down and, and avoid a, a safety problem. So that's kind of a quick summary of what we're working on. Uh, we think there's an enormous opportunity, both in Alpharetta, but in other uh, forward-looking communities around the country to begin to look at how to better protect the vulnerable road users. Um, just real quickly, if you look at the, some of the safety numbers that the USDOT puts out, it's the, in the area of pedestrians and bicyclists and, and things like this, where there's still a lot of uh, work to be done because those the number of casualties we see in this country are pretty high still. So we think this technology will be able to give our drivers better alerts, better warnings when they're about to enter a system, uh, an area situation where safety might be, uh, be a consideration. And eventually, I think we'll get to a point where the cars can actually break and take, in, take into account those conditions automatically, uh, particularly when we get to uh, highly automated vehicles where there is no driver in the car. This kind of technology is the path to make sure that everybody is kept as safe as possible. So there are really two programs we're talking about. One is for school zones and the other is for school buses. Brian, can you share some thoughts on some of the metrics around that and its importance and anticipated savings? Sure, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, Bill's got a camera pointed at a, at, a, at a school zone over here. Bill, maybe you can just show the folks what a school zone looks like. Uh, and that's a piece of infrastructure that it slows the traffic down when uh, the kids are getting on and off the buses. The reason why this is so important from a traffic engineering point of view is this, is that when you travel more slowly, you get a reduced uh, um, number of accidents or crashes, and also the crashes that you do have are less severe. It's something like if you uh, strike a pedestrian at uh, 20 miles an hour, there's a 90% probability of the pedestrian surviving. But if you strike a, a pedestrian at 40 miles an hour, there's a 10% probability of the, of the pedestrian surviving. So the business of reducing the speed of the vehicles under the special circumstances of the buses and, and the parents loading and offloading the kids um, is just um, a huge part of reducing um, crashes at these times, uh, particularly with, uh, uh, with the school buses. The second one is that where children gather 
uh, to get on and off the school bus. So there's been some horrific incidents of vehicles plowing into um, school buses and overtaking school buses and so forth. And um, uh, we're all just inattentive um, for a variety of reasons. Yes, some people can blame cell phones and so forth, but but really, I mean, you know, you've got screaming kids in the car or, or just distracted by your normal thought processes. And that release results in crashes in these circumstances. And so this is a first step um, of what's really an important process. And, and, and really, I'm going to throw this out there, uh, that what the government sector has done in Alpharetta and the North Fulton CID has enabled an environment where the private sector can collaborate. And it struck me actually yesterday, uh, which you don't know, so I was on a, the technology call between our technology guys and your technology guys. And it was actually so heartwarming to see all these technology guys as if they're speaking with one voice, just solving this problem. It's, you know, I mean, the, the, the problem is not about the radios or adversarial or having an argument or anything. The problem is, well, what distance behind the school bus do you think we should stop the car? You know, should we make it go bop, bop, or beep, beep? You know, should it, you know, what should the icons that appear on the dash look like? And so that's the power of collaboration. And we're a surface infrastructure company, and Audi's obviously a car manufacturer, a mobility manufacturer. And uh, it was just so powerful that that was unlocked very quickly. And we've got now these coordination calls every two weeks, which is like turning on a switch that's probably unstoppable. Because immediately in this discussion, there's all sorts of discussions about, well, what about this or what about that or what about the pedestrians and what about that? And we, you know, saying, well, let's just do this for starters, but that's a phase two and that's a phase three. So it's a potentially unstoppable process when you unlock the private sector collaboration like that. So in a nutshell, uh, what this technology does is enable your vehicle uh, to understand that they're in a, it's in a school zone or it's approaching a school bus that stopped. If you, as the driver, can't or don't realize it, is that correct? So the, so the vehicle knows what's going on and then informs the driver to react. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Brad, you, you can speak more to this as, as the Audi guy, but it goes to this business about we transitioning to highly automated vehicles. Now, there are two schools of thoughts uh, you know, in, in the market. One is that you jump immediately to a fully automated vehicle. That's been you know, some companies' approach. Other pro people's approach is that it's more of a, 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 um, a, a transition. And so, yes, this is the idea of smart infrastructure, school beacons, and the school buses broadcasting their status for Audi's next generation of vehicles to receive that information and then behave appropriately. Brad? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, we wanted to start this project um, because we, there's no need to wait. Uh, as Brian said, we don't need to wait for the era of fully automated vehicles. We can start giving drivers today uh, alerts when they're entering a dangerous situation. And, you know, I think it's really important. One of the great things about this and one of the reasons why we're really excited to be in Alpharetta is because you need all of the, the primary players engaged in this. You know, Alpharetta has to, and other cities have to install the, the, the infrastructure. Brian's team actually has to make the infrastructure so that it can get the word out that something's going on. And of course, we have to be um, there to receive the information and take appropriate action um, you know, in a, in a like in a in a similar way, school bus manufacturers have to be involved because they're the ones also sending out the beacons. So, you have to have this complete um, environment where we're looking to really advance safety together, because e just one of those uh, pillars can't do it by itself. And you know, the problem's pretty real. Um, you know, it just it, it, it hundred kids being killed walking to and from school is is too much. And 25,000 in the U.S. Are, are, are seriously injured just walking to school because of traffic incidents. It, this is, you know, this is something that we can all agree in, in Alpharetta and, and other cities around the country and states. It's a problem that we can't address with the technology now and then continue to evolve it um, to the point where 
the cars can uh, react automatically. And, and that's what we really wanted to show here with the school bus and school zone to protect really the most vulnerable of the people on the roads today. And then just to add on to that, um, so this is the, f the first phase, but there are all kinds of dangerous situations that occur uh, that this base technology can help resolve. So, for example, I'm mean, choosing Audi as an example, but all cars suffer from this. They shouldn't run through red lights. They should know that there's a red light ahead and then either stop or tell the driver, first of all, tell the driver, and then future vehicles sh should stop. They shouldn't be able to go wrong way down a on-ramp of, of the freeway. Uh, they shouldn't, they should know that cyclists are ahead. They should know that the pedestrian crossing is ahead. And when there's a pedestrian in that crossing, and likewise, you should be able to warn the, 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 the pedestrian in the crossing that the Audi is approaching. And this is all the potential that we've been talking about for a long time with connected vehicles. And I'm just absolutely delighted that we've seemed to unlock the, the recipe, which is not from the federal government down with some kind of mandate, but this is from the local government up, is deploy the infrastructure with some day one applications, the paramedics are getting green lights, and then use that technology to bring Audi into the infrastructure here in Alpharetta, and then from here to the rest of Georgia or the rest of Atlanta, and then from there uh, to, uh, to, to the rest of the states and the rest of the world. So it's really just the, the start of a, of a multi-dimensional thing with phase one, phase two, phase three here in Alpharetta, and then extending that geographically out. Well, I think it's exciting to see the collaboration between Audi and your company, Brian. Uh, you said should be able to do this, should be able to do that. What you guys are trying to do is change the should to a can very quickly. I mean, we already have signal preemption for first responders, which is clearly uh, contributing to life-saving situations by uh, expediting the time it takes a first responder to get to an incident or a uh, a fire or a heart attack or a stroke or uh, uh, even a drug overdose by, by shortening that time span safely. Uh, and this just continues to build on that. Yes, and that, that was the, the interesting thing when we were talking about the stroke uh, response of the, of the North Hospital System. Uh, and so we play our role in getting, you know, those paramedics to that, uh, to that stroke victim more quickly. And, uh, and it's quite interesting. I mean, that's a, a potential thing for, for, for Audi we, you know, to discuss as a phase two. We've all sat there at a traffic light and whoa, 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 you, you have the emergency vehicle. And you, can, you can't tell which direction it's coming from. So the business of your Audi speaking to you and say emergency vehicle approaching from behind or from the right or from the left. And again, that what our role is, is to equip the infrastructure. So that's the kind of infrastructure that's on the Alpharetta fire tracks already. And now the next discussion is, Audi, so what do you want to do? What do, you want, what do you want to say to your customers under that circumstances? Would they find it valuable to know that the, that the fire tracks, uh, which direction the fire track is and which direction they should get out the way? Uh, so uh, as soon as you start this connected vehicle program, it leads to all kinds of really interesting uh, applications which can all evolve not unlike your smartphones interestingly enough in other words you all started off with smartphones and now the applications that fit on that base technology uh just follow one after the other after the other brad any any thoughts yeah you know a lot of times we look at the future of automated technology and connected vehicles as sort of the science fiction world and you know, not only is it happening now or in a poise to happen, um, we can talk in a little bit about um, how we get this on the roads in a more comprehensive way. But there's, you know, there's the opportunity to not think about the magic of taking your hands off the wheel, but using these technologies to make you better drivers, to make your car better perform in an emergency situation like a congested road where an ambulance has to get through. Um, and to really not so much be uh, this hands-free world, but to really help uh, uh, improve the cognitive overload that all of us feel on the roads all the time. You know, we're, we're sort of constantly assaulted uh, mentally with a lot of inputs that uh, aren't made any better by mobile technology. And, and now we can use these systems to help uh, share that workload a, a bit better 
and to be safer um, and, and help the driver understand what's going on in the environment around them better. Well, that's a great segue to the obvious question. What can we expect in terms of the timing of your development and deployment of, of more capabilities? And then as a follow-up to that, what's next? What is, plan- what is the next step in your program? I'll, I'll start with uh, the timing. You know, one of the, the big obstacles that we have right now is that the cellular V2X technology, vehicle-to-everything technology that we'll be dis- deploying in Alpharetta, technically isn't even allowed by the Federal Communications uh, uh, Commission yet. So the FCC this week is going to have to lift that barrier and say it's this is the preferred technology. We want it to operate in the spectrum. Um, and so we're looking forward to that, but we wanted to get a, a, off to a, a fast start in places like Alpharetta. And so we're using uh, experimental licenses to get the development and get the, the systems up and, and optimized uh, very well uh, so that the performance is good for the moment when we can begin to install them in the vehicles. Now, in the automotive world, as most of you can understand or appreciate, you, you don't just start putting things in overnight. There's a whole electronics architecture that has to be taken into consideration and all sorts of business cases around the world. So, you know, we're looking at this in um, in more widespread use in the next, you know, within a couple of years at the earliest. But, you know, we first had to have the green light from the FCC to say, this is the path forward. And now we can begin to put them actually in vehicles and in customer hands. Yes. And so the, 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 the interesting thing and the exciting thing as well, and for, for some of the stakeholders who, 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 who've invested in, in putting this technology out in the street, there's some practical and tangible results. Uh, you know, so, so Audi and Applied Information, uh, we're going to prove all this technology out at the IATL, and then we've got an experimental license uh, which handles 75 square miles of road around here where we can, quote-unquote, go and play in the traffic uh, safely. But this has got the eyes of the world on it. And so, in, in a COVID permitting, the, uh, what's called ITS America, that's the Intelligent Transportation System America, uh, organization is having their uh, Congress here in Atlanta on the strength of the work that we're doing here. And they're all going to come up to the IATL uh, to see Audi and, and Applied Information and the IATL doing, doing what we do. And then in July, the, um, what's called the 5GAA, the 5G Automotive uh, Association, uh, which is an international group of folks championing this technology, they're going to come here for their uh, um, the, the North American conference at the end of July, also to come here and see all of this working in practice. So all of us as practitioners, we're transitioning in the first half of next year away from this being a theoretical exercise to let's go and jump in this Audi and see it all working. And so that's very exciting as a practitioner in this thing to, to, to see it all working uh, here in, in Alpharetta. Well, this is exciting stuff, and there's already benefits coming uh, or in place because of all this and some neat things on the horizon. Uh, Thank you both to our panelists. I'm not sure whether I'm over time or out of time, but this says I need to turn it over to Callie after thanking Brian and Brad once again uh, to see if there are any questions from our audience. Callie? Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. Yes, um, we've got a couple of questions in our Q&A. Um, we are, uh, our first question was actually a mixture of the question on the timeline that you, uh, had asked, uh, talking about the process for implementation when for a long time, there's going to be a mixture of both non-connected and smart vehicles. Um, and I'm sure that's obviously a, a concern for folks who maybe are on the road and thinking, oh no, I don't want to go to that, that direction. And then we've got the same folks saying, oh, I'm ready to go now. So maybe speak to that mixture. I think uh, initially the opportunity here is to provide alerts and uh, advice and guidance to the drivers um, so that they can make better decisions um, right off the bat. And we don't have to wait for that. Um, you already get a lot of alerts, thing, bells going off in your car. Of course, we don't want it to turn into some kind of tubular symphony, but we do want, we do want it to be uh, 
something to get your attention when you need to be paying attention and know what the situation is. Um, now, eventually, you're going to have a, more of a mix of cars driving uh, in automated modes. And this technology is what really, uh, I like to call it, it, it's like the icing on the cake because now your automated vehicle is better able to see farther away than just what its sensors can pick up on the road around it. And, uh, you know, that's going to be critical as we have, uh, you know, legacy cars that we're driving today, you know, 10, 11 years from now, they'll still be on the road. So it takes about 10, 11, 12 years before we have a complete turnover into more modern and, and advanced cars. So that's going to be a, a situation we'll live with for quite a while, except in maybe some very specific zones. But we can use this technology now to help inform you as a driver better. And, and and you know to to add to that um, the the business of bringing and this is why the five GAA includes what we call the mobile network operators, which is the guys that run your your smartphones. This is also part of the puzzle. What happens when we put some of this extra radio technology in smartphones and and so forth? What happens is when we make uh, little devices that go on your bicycle, and uh, but but. But in order to do this, you have to start somewhere. And so the, this is what's really exciting about this is, it, and this has been the big problem with connected vehicles, is not when do we finish, but how do we get started? And so that's what we and Audi are showing is this is how you get started by just doing it. Uh, and then that will, success will lead to success. And it'll take us in all kinds of directions that, that we probably can't predict. But we've got to get started, and that the starting of all of this is uh, right now. Well, and Brian, you just mentioned it, so I'm going to skip a question and head to. Um, we've got a question about. I'm wondering where cyclists and runners fit into the equation. Wearable fitness electronics are nearly ubiquitous now. Any thoughts about how to integrate these technologies into the mix? With fullest respect to Audi, many are imagining a world where people are using bicycles more and cars less. Maybe I can pick that one up first, and Brian, you can finish it off. Um, so cyclists and pedestrians are right at the top of our priority list and definitely something we want to continue to make advances toward. Um, as a practical reality, a lot of our technology partners will, will caution that it's, you can't be too optimistic yet because a lot of these radio signals, uh, they, they will drain your phone pretty quickly or they run hot. And so the technology is going to continue to develop just as all technology does to get better, small, uh, smaller, more powerful over time. And we're not talking about decades here. I think it will happen relatively quickly. But, um, you know, these are these are the, the pathways we want to explore, particularly because the problem of bicyclists and pedestrian uh, fatalities has been persistent. And um, as the question uh, raised, you know, more people will be doing probably more bicycling and, you know, walking to and from work or stores in, a, in an era that we've just been through with COVID. So, uh, you know, I think there's a, definitely a, a place for that kind of mobility. And we want the, the vehicle systems to be able to recognize that. Yeah. And to, you know, to add on to that, how the entrepreneurship and innovative side of this plays out is that Audi and uh, Virginia Tech, I believe it was up in Virginia, has just completed a similar pilot project related to work zones. And work zones are the business of uh, having Audi, uh, and Audi in this case, not hit a construction worker in a work zone. So the, the discussion there was, well, let's make a wearable that goes in the cons construction vest. And so we on that, you know, as an entrepreneurial um, company in the space, we said, well, maybe what we, it's time for us to make such a product that goes in the, we've got all sorts of technologies that do all sorts of things. Maybe it's time for us to make a product that goes in the construction worker's vest. Well, then we go, well, that maybe that same product, which is, you know, maybe this sort of size of a, like a fob, uh, goes on your bicycle or goes in the backpack of your child's, um, on his way to school. And so as we get going with this technology, it leads us into all kinds of ways where, you know, God bless America, this is what American innovation is all about, is that if there's a market for it, we'll develop and sell it and make it and make it successful uh, faster than you can blink an eye. 
Wonderful. Um, I have another question, uh, a nod of the head, another one to Audi. As an Audi owner and an engineer by training, I love the implications from a sustainability perspective. What opportunities are there for the education community to engage with the implementation, for example, communication campaigns, student research projects, et cetera? Yeah, that's, uh, that fits into the other hat that I wear a lot of the time, which is the organization called Partners for AV Education. And I think increasingly, this is exactly what we need to do. We need to better educate um, a whole host of our, our population on what technology can uh, actually do in a, in a socially productive way to improve safety and uh, other quality of life issues. So um, definitely, I think this is something we need to work on, particularly in the school zone, school bus project. You know, I think it's also an opportunity to get kids excited about technology and to uh, look at it as a, as a even more cool profession to pursue uh, for engineering and other things. So uh, definitely uh, it's a topic that we want to continue to um, work with uh, cities and school districts. And this is a, a great opportunity to show how that can happen. And uh, also, thank you for buying an Audi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then that's a, just to add, add to that, that uh, at the IITL, that's one of the key things that uh, we see is the IITL is being able to somewhere where the kids can come and see all of this working, can come and uh, be excited about, uh, you know, the, the, the business of technology collaboration, um, potentially changing the world. And uh, we, they, they, you know, that's reach out to us through the, through the IITL website and uh, we'll set it up and uh, and and come around and have a look. Well, Ehab happens to be a member, so we'll make sure to get him connected with y'all. I think that would be great for the students there. Um, I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time in this new Zoom world. We usually try to end right at 10 till so folks can get to their next uh, Zoom call. But I do have one final question for uh, you gentlemen. Uh, and Carrie asked, you know, kind of what's next? What, you know, what are you thinking of next? But I think, um, you know, this is a great opportunity from a, a, a opportunity to address the business community and folks who who are out and working with not just entrepreneurs, Brian, to your point, but with, you know, large existing businesses. Maybe how can we get more involved or be more aware? What are the steps that we can take? Because this is happening. It's not a matter of, of if. It is a matter of when, and I think that's, you know, we're all grappling with when will this take place? And I know you don't have a crystal ball. So what, what piece of advice or recommendation would you give to, to us out here as we're, we're looking future to the future? Um, from my standpoint, um, we want to just, we're, we're in the process right now of, of looking at all the different opportunities that we can tackle um, you know, we can't do them all at once, but as Brian said, you do, you know, phase one, phase two, and, and pretty soon you've got a, 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 a snowballing situation happening. Um, so we want to know what uh, other innovators think about opportunities for, for apps and things like that. You know, it's the same as Brian said with, uh, with smartphones. Uh, the platform was there and then all the app developers came up with ideas. So I think something similar to that will, is what will take place once you understand how the technology works and how do you get signals to the drivers or, or occupants of the cars and things like that. Very good. Thank you. Bill, oh, excuse me, Brian. Yeah. Just, just one final thought from my side, which you know, might, may come across as contentious, but it, but it isn't. Uh, what, what we're living with a situation in the United States where the road infrastructure uh, over the last hundred years has been built by the government in various ways, federal government, state government, local government, county governments, and so forth. And now we're in the business of technology in the roadway. I mean, we had the situation for a hundred years that the only connection between the car and the infrastructure was through the rubber on the tires. And now we are so much more involved in this whole connected world uh, with all sorts of radios doing all sorts of things that it's just really difficult for all your local authorities to keep up with this. So my suggestion is for all the folks and the influences in this area, let's focus the government at all levels on the outcomes, the public policies. You're going to have to 
yield the implementation of all of this over to the private sector, where suddenly there are all kinds of companies like ourselves and others who are standing up and saying, we can play a role uh, in collaborating with the Audis of the world in actually delivering these solutions, because the same solution that works for Audi actually also works for the Alpharetta fire tracks. But, but it would be impossible for the, the local authority to know and understand how we can make all these connections. And so this is what's really exciting uh, for entrepreneurship and the young folks who want to build businesses in this space. It's, it's, it's hugely exciting. Uh, and the, the, the various government role is going to be much more on the public policy side. Uh, and there's going to be huge opportunities for young entrepreneurs to step up into implementation uh, in this world. And, and that's very exciting. Thank you, Brian. And, and we know there's much debate on the policy side, as you're aware of. And so we uh, we continue to, to follow that as well. I do want to thank, um, you mentioned the infrastructure and investment of government. I think it's wonderful. And I appreciate the North Fulton CID um, in sponsoring this particular event and its investment into our infrastructure in this area. It's a great opportunity to to be able to move things forward. And so I, I certainly think that, that that's a great way to do things as well. Um, so thank you to both Carrie and Brandon, who I know are on here um, with us. Again, this is the uh, all the time that we have for today. I do want to thank our impressive line of panelists. Uh, as I mentioned, Carrie Armstrong with the Atlanta Regional Commission, Pope and Land Real Estate, and of course, the North Fulton CID. We have Brad Sertz with Audi of America and Brian Mulligan with Applied Information. Thank you, gentlemen. We cannot offer great programs like this one without our sponsors. So once again, I want to thank Wellstone North Fulton Hospital and the North Fulton CID for their tremendous support, as well as John Ray, who has been a great partner in supporting GNFCC through our, our media um, and sponsoring the, the podcast and the, the recording of this. This concludes our Wellstar monthly event series for 2020. We are looking forward to having you join us in 2021 for our new and impressive lineup of presenters and speakers. We do have several more events planned for the remainder of the year. And one of those will be um, tomorrow. We have a uh, Tech 400 is touring the new Fulton County Schools Innovation Academy, the new STEM school that replaced the old Milton High School in downtown Alpharetta. Registration is required. We've got a great group coming to do tours of their incredible technology. And of course, there will be many students there working on these types of projects as we move forward to register. And of course, check out any of our chamber's events. You can go to gnfcc.com and see the information there in order to register. We hope that all of you have a wonderful afternoon and we are adjourned. Thank you.